Welcome to Hence the Future podcast. I'm Adam Cronin. And I'm Justin Clark. And today we're discussing the future of negotiation. That means we'll get into what makes for effective negotiating on a biological and psychological level, and also how technology could completely change the game for negotiations in the future. But first, let's start with why negotiation is an important topic for us to address. Yeah, I mean, so negotiation shows up in pretty much every aspect of our lives, and essentially it boils down to getting what you want, which I think anyone would argue that it's it's good to get what you want in a lot of cases, and it shows up in places like your personal life, whether that's trying to convince your spouse of a certain type of interior design or where to go out to eat or in your professional life like asking your boss for a raise or whether or not you can work remotely and it also shows up um, in your professional life by being able to convince others of your ideas or your business idea and this is this helps out in um, entrepreneurship so it shows up in a lot of different areas. and I, I sort of have a different definition of at least how I think of negotiation. Okay, I'm I curious. mean, getting what you want is one way you could look at it. But I look at it more like getting the other person to see that you both have the same goal. So okay. making the other person realize that your goals are aligned and whatever future path you're leading them towards is not only the optimal future path for yourself, it's also the future the optimal future path for your negotiating counterpart. Yeah, yeah, I guess that was kind of a, an individual centric uh, yeah. definition. But the um, the problem arises when you don't actually want the same thing. Um, like if, if you have two competing goals, not like you don't always compete with people that have the same exact ideas or the same exact goals. Um, but Yes, I mean negotiation is really. Well, a way I just to... don't know if I would use the word compete for uh, to describe negotiation. I would use the word yeah. collaborate. Yeah, that that's probably a better way to look at it, and you know that shows up in a lot of negotiation books is to look at it um, in that way. But ultimately, you're 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 getting what you want while the other person is getting what they want as well, or the other party. So it's you know, there's I guess there's several different ways you can frame negotiation um anyways right yeah the goal is to get the best possible outcome for both parties i would say and i think this gets at you know one of our questions on this episode which is what's the difference between debate and negotiation Mm -hmm. and the key difference in my mind is that in debate you're trying to win you're trying to own the other person you're trying to destroy them with your logic and reason (laughs) like you would see on some Ben Shapiro YouTube video. But that's not what negotiation is. Negotiation is trying to make your counterpart feel like they're the hero and that they're doing the they're getting the best that they could possibly get while you Mm -hmm. also know that you're getting what you know to be the best outcome for yourself or at least a favorable outcome for yourself. Mm -hmm. So the best way I've described negotiation is as listener's judo. It's like you're more focused than anything else on active listening to the other person. And you're just guiding the conversation by asking open-ended questions to lead it down the path that you've sort of planned out as the right way for the conversation to go Mm -hmm. without showing any sort of aggression or making it seem like there's any sort of, competition between the two of you really making yourselves feel like you're on the same side and if you ever do need to show some assertiveness or or some sort of like a you know anger or passion or something like that it should always be directed at the deal that's not right you know we haven't gotten to the right agreement rather than it being about the person who's a dick or who's too uh, aggressive or, or anything like that so I think this idea of listeners judo is is the way that I think about negotiation. And mm-hmm. Yeah, and I mean, so I would say debate is probably similar though. But I mean, there's a lot of different ways you can negotiate and a lot of different ways you can debate. Like the, the Ben Shapiro debate method is kind of similar to the Donald Trump negotiation method where it's just kind of an aggressive way to do uh, I don't know if I would agree with that either because if you think of, I mean, yeah, Donald Trump has done some crazy things in public 
as sort of a theatrical performance to get his hardliners even more on his side, like with making, you know, ripping at the press and all that kind of stuff. But if you see him actually sit down at the negotiating table with someone like Kim Jong-un, he doesn't, you know, he he says, oh, Kim Jong-un was great. He's a fantastic guy. We watch movies together. He's a really great leader. I know he's going to do the right thing. And that's a much more effective negotiating strategy than if he were just saying like, you know, this guy's crazy and, you know, we're going to blow him up. And of course, he used a little bit of that early on strategically. Mm -hmm. But when they actually sat down together, he was like Kim Jong-un's best friend. Yeah. Yeah. And it's sort of an unpredictable negotiation tactic. But I guess what I was just trying to say is there's a lot of different ways you can negotiate. And there's, um, you know, you, you can approach it in different ways and there's different tactics. And it works depending on what type of negotiator you are or what kind of person you are and you kind of have to tailor your negotiation based on these different sorts of things so not everyone's negotiating in the same way and uh, right. maybe you can talk a little bit about what these uh, different types of people are different types of negotiators yeah so before you go anyone goes into a negotiation you should be aware of what type of negotiator you yourself are and also what type of negotiator your counterpart is and there are three main types there are assertive types accommodators and analysts so an assertive type is like i would consider myself an assertive type which is someone who thinks that time is money you have a bias towards action you'd rather get a deal done then, you know, even if it's not 100% perfect, then mm-hmm. really waste a lot of time like tinkering with all the different terms and conditions. And you view silence as an opportunity to say something or an opportunity to guide the, the conversation. Mm-hmm. And that's very different from the other types. So for instance, an analyst type is someone who really just is convinced by data and they view time as a way to prepare. And they view silence as an opportunity to think more. And Mm. they're going to be really hesitant to do anything that they haven't already thought through. They really don't like surprises. They would much prefer to have thought everything out beforehand and then really think about things. And then only if it makes rational sense from an analytical perspective would they be willing to move forward. And their motto is that, you know, whatever it takes to get the job done right would be sort of their mindset. And a lot of engineers are like this and data people. I think you're, yeah, I you're probably an I'm, analyst, yeah. Yeah, that's kind of what I would consider myself as well. Right, and then there are accommodators. And accommodators are people who are might be described as people pleasers, where they're really all about the relationship. And a lot of B2B guys are like this, you know, they kind of butter you up and, oh, how are the kids, how's the wife? And And these people tend to waste a lot of time and they tend to not want to address the real elephants in the room and actually get down to brass tacks. And they care more about maintaining a good relationship than actually getting a deal done or getting the right terms in place. Um, But they're really good at making people feel at ease. And, you know, they can be a great person to have on your negotiating team. The other thing to consider is that every person has different aspects of each of these types within themselves. And it's not like one type is way better than any of the other types. It's more like you should draw off of the strengths of each of them. But you should also be really aware of who your counterpart is. And there are different skills that work better with different types of people. So for instance, if you're dealing with an assertive type, like let's say a a Mark Cuban, the best strategy is to mirror them. And mirroring is basically where you just take on whatever style they have and you repeat the last three words of whatever they said and make it a question. So if they say like, you know, like, now what what really means, you know, what really matters to us is efficiency and you like efficiency. And they're like, yeah, you know, we need to get as many deals possible uh, through our system in the shortest possible time with the greatest profit and they're like, profit and they're like yes you know it really matters the cost <laughs> and they basically tell you everything that's on their mind and you're using listeners judo to get all of the appropriate information out of them and so if you're dealing with an assertive type that's a mm-hmm. great strategy to have 
Yeah, and I mean the reason it's a great type to have is, or a great uh, tool to have is because with the assertive type, they like to talk. So right. the more the more information that you have going into a negotiation, the better position you will be because you can kind of see what their motivations are and you can figure out where the alignment is and where the misalignment is and how to come up with terms that fit both sides as right. well as possible and fits it fits your terms as much as possible while also giving the other party what they want because if you have what they want on like the basic principles level the fundamental level then you can come up with totally different terms than they were expecting, but they still ultimately get what they want. And it's probably better uh, for you in the long run too, to change up um, what they want. Cause I think one of the other things that you see with assertive types is they'll come out with a low ball offer kind of right away, just get something done. And you'll see this with a Donald Trump type of tactic as well. They'll try to get these super out. They'll say something right away like we want to increase tariffs by 25 percent right or saying or when he was running for election he said we're going to deport every illegal alien yeah you know within the first year that i'm president and obviously that's like there's no way you could get that done even in the first term of your presidency and there are so many roadblocks but it was directional he was showing the direction of where he intended to go and that made everyone scramble to, to catch up with him and say, OK, well, maybe we can just strengthen the border walls and have some more strict terms for migrants coming into the country. And he already pushed the conversation so many rungs higher than it had been you know, thus far because mm -hmm. of the anchoring effect. And that's a really powerful tool in negotiation. And, you know, the classic negotiation tips that they'll teach you in school is that you should never give the first offer. And that's mm -hmm. usually good advice. You usually want the other person to show their cards first. But if the other side is, is really pushing you to make the first offer, it's good to give a very high offer or you know low offer if you're on the seller side, whatever it is. And also to give a range is another good tactic because if you give a range, like let's say you know, your boss is asking you how much you feel would be would be good compensation, fair compensation for your role, rather than saying like, you know, $200,000, that's what I'm worth. That can come off as a little aggressive. So if instead you say like, you know, I think anywhere from, you know, 180 to, to 230 or, or something would be yeah. reasonable based on other, you know, similar types of job roles, like this company hired people for that sort of amount then it seems like you're coming from a, from a more ra rational place and you don't seem mm -hmm. like you're asking for too much if you give a range. And if you mm -hmm. can give like a third party example of another company, then that sort of anchors the mindset towards a higher number and you know opens up the negotiation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the other thing too with giving a range is if, especially with a a salary raise the problem that you run into is oh if they're okay with 185 to 135 we'll just give them 185 mm -hmm. but you can also add different terms to the agreement you could say well you know this you know on the low end you know it's it's a little bit low on the salary end but maybe I can have a little bit more equity at that stage and then if we do a higher salary maybe there's a little bit less equity so you can just you can do a little bit of um, term negotiation that isn't just right, the non-monetary yeah but as far as the order I, I don't know if i would do it in that way where i say oh well if it's the low end you got to give me this but if it's the high end i don't need that I, the from the the book never split the difference chris voss he talks about how you should always start with the non-monetary items so mm -hmm. let's say you're going to your boss for negotiation don't go in there and say hey i'm i'm worth one hundred and thirty thousand dollars. you know i should i deserve that mm -hmm. Go in there and first say, I'd like to talk about a title change. I've been accomplishing X, Y, and Z. This warrants a title change. I can really live up to this. Here's the extra value I can provide. And then say, you know, I really care about this company with, with this company to grow and to have the incentives aligned the right way. I would, you know, like to have some equity stake in the company. And then you get to the monetary stuff last, either if they throw it out first or if you're first to throw it out, then you should give them a sort of a range. 
But that's that's a really good tactic is to always start with the non-monetary items because mm-hmm. it puts people away from the sort of haggling mindset and it gets more into the aligning incentives mindset. Yeah. So how would you deal with the range situation then? If so you, you should be prepared. You should be prepared to accept the lowest part of the range. Yeah. So but that's essentially like giving yourself an offer, uh, giving yourself some value. Um, but I guess if, if you accept the low end of the range, that's still giving agency to the decision maker. Is that right. kind of the tactic? And it makes them feel like, oh, 130 grand is a bargain when the higher range was, you know, 210 200. or whatever yeah, it was. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So how would you, we've talked about how to kind of deal with an assertive type. How would you deal with an analytical type yeah so with an analyst the most important thing is to do your homework and have data Mm -hmm. so you really need to find out what's a what's a rational analytical argument that you can make for this being the right decision for the analyst to make you have to have all of that prepared ahead of time If the more you can give them a heads up, like sending them data beforehand, giving them time to soak it in, establishing credibility, all of those are really important to an analyst type. Mm -hmm. Um, Labels tend to work somewhat well for for um, analysts, whereas mirroring doesn't tend to work as well. I mean, it still works, but it's not as good as assertive types because assertives will just keep talking and talking. So it's not going to (laughs) work as well to ask, you know open-ended questions to analysts because they tend to you know be more closed but if you label their hesitations that does tend to work well so labeling is effectively just stating what the other person's emotion is or at least what you think they are yeah or you seem to be feeling x yeah it seems like you have some hesitation here or Mm -hmm. it sounds like you need some approval from people who aren't on this phone call or Mm -hmm. You know, it looks like you are still considering some other options. So you ask those 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 questions, and you or or, or you, you label their emotions with a calibrated question, and then that way it gets it it basically cancels out their hesitation. And they have a they did a study actually with brain scans where they would prompt people to feel a certain emotion, like they would show them an image of you know, some horrible, violent act or something that would generate a a fear response or some hesitation. And then they would actually label it like they would say, like, you know, we're seeing that you are experiencing fear in your amygdala, your amygdala is lighting up. And as soon as they labeled the fear, the amygdala stopped lighting up. So by recognizing the emotional state of your counterpart, it actually cancels out that emotional state. So if you say you seem hesitant or you seem concerned or it seems like you're afraid that if this deal doesn't go through, then it'll leave you in a tough position or, you know, whatever it is, whatever you think their hesitation is or their worry or whatever emotion is that driving them. If you say it out in the open, it cancels out that effect and then you can move on to the next thing. And you can ask them questions and you can get more information about why they're feeling that way. And then you can start to come up with better terms for the analytical person that will help them, you know, get over whatever hesitation they have, Mm -hmm. whatever they're feeling. So, um, yeah, I like that a lot. Um, What do you think about the... um, For accommodators? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. (laughs) Yeah. So to deal with an accommodator, it's really important to focus on implementation. Because what you have to realize with this group is that they'll talk and talk and they'll be friendly, but they probably aren't going to get things done unless you really drive them towards what needs to happen to get things done. And it's not just about getting them to say yes, because they could say yes and then sort of like wiggle out of it later. It's really about getting them to say yes and then actually implement the plan. So for accommodators, you really want to ask them a lot of questions like, okay, so how would that work? Like, Walk me through the steps that we can achieve our intended goals or our intended outcomes. So for accommodators, it's really good to just 
clearly delineate what the terms of the deal are, how it's going to happen, get it in writing, make sure people who aren't on the call are on board and, you know, get that, get that done. And the worst match for accommodators are other accommodators because then they'll just talk and talk and waste time. And the worst match for assertive types are analysts and the worst types for analysts are assertive types because they'll basically just, you know, the, the, the assertive type will keep talking and talking while the analyst is trying to think. And the analyst is like, every time I try to think this guy keeps talking, how annoying is this guy? And why is he, (laughs) and he's not even using data. He's too emotional. And the assertive type is like, God, this guy is just like cold standoffish. He's Uh not giving me anything. He, he doesn't see the vision here. Why is he dragging his heels so much? Doesn't he see that this deal is good for both of us? And then the the and then meanwhile the accommodator is getting nervous at any time there's silence because he's like oh the relationship's not as good as it could be, <laughs> so it's really funny thinking about these three types and when I learned these types I immediately just started categorizing everyone in my life who I knew into one of these types and it's <laughs> way easier to deal with people when you recognize that. Yeah. So. What would you say to obviously putting people in these these sort of categories helps, but I think it would also be helpful to see that some people are a little bit analyst in some sense and a little bit assertive in another sense. So right. they can so you can tailor your negotiation to kind of and well and the other thing too is it depends on the type of negotiation. I've seen some people get super emotional and assertive about certain types of negotiation and then with others they just they just want to maintain a relationship so it's like sometimes people can be assertive and sometimes people can be accommodators it just depends on what the situation is so right. it's almost it's almost like you need to in real time figure out what is the what is this other person in this exact scenario because you don't necessarily know what you know what is always important to this person they're not necessarily going to fall under one clean category Um, yeah that's a really good point and it brings up an important topic which is that there's a game being played beneath the game that's on the surface that most people don't even realize and that game is what's really driving people what are the needs that they have that aren't totally rational or monetary what needs are there for their emotional, their emotional needs, their self-esteem, their ego? What do they need to be fulfilled other than just the you know, cold terms of the agreement? Yeah. I mean, it, yeah, I mean, there's, there's so much to people, then you just need to figure out what, what they do want. And, you know, I don't even know if I have a good uh, recommendation, and maybe you do, but it's it's really hard to figure out the true motives of people unless you just talk to them and ask questions like totally like, yeah like in, you can't you can't make assumptions about people unless you really know them and you just need to get to know people and that's i think that's why we see um a lot of these long form conversations being really uh useful is we can actually get in the heads of people and we can understand the wants and desires of people and you know and I think people are probably realizing that a little bit more now that, mm-hmm. that there's there's more to people than what we just experience on the surface. Yeah. So maybe you have maybe you yeah, have I mean, seen some good ways to deal with this. Right. I mean, the one tip I would give that also Chris Voss gives in his book is find out the other person's religion and mm. not only their actual religion, like are they a Christian, a Jew or whatever, but what are the the beliefs that they hold that are their cornerstone of their identity? Kind of like, um, you know, how in Westworld, there's like the cornerstone of every AI that they create, which Mm -hmm. is sort of the basis for their whole worldview. Like, what is the basis for your counterpart's worldview? Is it religious? Are they really just all about stewardship and being a good person and taking care of their flock and that kind of a thing? Mm -hmm. Or are they someone who is really just they have this vision of themselves as this like master deal maker and they really just need their ego stroked and to show how cool they are Mm -hmm. and they need pats on the back. Or is this someone who like just needs other people to 
to recognize how great he is like like i feel like a lot of scientists and engineers are kind of like that where it's like they just want the glory of like solving certain problems and like having <laughs> yeah. the actual metrics look a certain way so they can be like wow i did that and it's and you know getting that sort of recognition so you really got to find out what drives people and it's all from listeners judo asking open-ended questions and finding out what will fulfill their needs especially their emotional needs. And there's a, a great way to illustrate this is the way that negotiators work in hostage situations. So in hostage situations, they have a saying that the hostage, or sorry, the kidnapper frees the hostage, not when he gets everything that he thought he could get, but when he feels like he got everything that he thought he could get. Mm-hmm. So if if a kidnapper asks for a million dollars to free a hostage and the family is really wealthy and they say, you know what, we can, we barely can scrape it together, but we could scrape together a million dollars and they, we want to give it away. And they give that to the hostage or to the kidnapper right away. The kidnapper is going to say, oh, that was easy. They must have a lot more than a million dollars. Therefore, I'm going to say, thanks for the down payment, but I'm going to require another million dollars if you don't want me to chop off their head in the next day. So it's really about, do they feel like they got the best deal they could get rather than did they actually get the best deal they could get? So that's why it's counterintuitive, but a lot of the world's best hostage negotiators will really negotiate down all the way down to, you know, from a million dollars all the way down to like $4,871 mm-hmm. plus a car stereo. And they make it. They make the kidnapper really feel like, wow, my counterpart could not give over another penny. They that's this is simply all they have. This is the best deal I'm ever going to get. Therefore, I'm going to take the money, give that, give back the hostage, and run. And so, yeah. you, so even if you're not dealing with kidnappers, you want to make the counterpart feel like they got the best they could get out of it, so they don't have buyer's remorse. You want both parties to feel like they had a win rather than the mm-hmm. conventional wisdom of just splitting the difference and then basically both parties come out feeling like they lost. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and like you said, that you have to really understand what the other person's desires are. But that also, the big thing here that I'm taking away and what they talked about a lot and uh, never split the difference was it really matters how you frame something. It really matters how you frame the negotiation and what you can give up. So like you're saying it like this, if you say, okay, we can scrape together $500,000 very quickly, you frame it in the sense that, okay, this negotiate, this hostage or sorry, this, um, kidnapper can get more from the situation. But if, like you said, if you frame it in the sense that if you frame it in a way that makes it seem like, wow, we really just, this is really pushing it, dude. Like we can't really get right. this much money together then they're more willing and they can feel like they actually came out with a win. And this happens in a lot of different situations too, just being able to frame um, the terms differently. Right. And this also really gets at how do you say no? If the kidnapper demands a certain amount of money, how do you say no without pissing them off and getting them to potentially Mm -hmm. chop off your loved one's fingers? Mm -hmm. And they talk about in the book that you can say no four times before you actually have to say the words no, and no. And okay. you do that by asking an open-ended question in response that gets the other person to see the world through your eyes and start to solve your own problems. So if someone says, you got to hand over a million dollars by tomorrow or else I'm going to cut off her fingers, then say, mm-hmm. how am I supposed to do that? How am I supposed to hand over a million dollars? What? How am I supposed to get that to you? Is it a wire transfer? Like, how am I supposed to do it? Also, I don't have this money. You know, I might have to sell my cars to get this together. Like, like how mm-hmm. am I supposed to come up with this money in that amount of time? Like, help me help you kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. And then the kidnapper has to actually figure that out. Like, and another <laughs> great quote from the book is that yes is nothing without how. So how is your best friend? Getting someone to mm-hmm. say yes means nothing unless you actually have the how behind the yes. And there's an awesome example of this from one of his negotiation classes where a student for the first class will come to his, will come through the door and he'll say, Hey, I'll give you how much for your shirt. 
the shirt off your back. And he's like, what? And he's like, how much for your shirt? And the student will say, a thousand dollars. And he says, okay, give me your shirt. And he, he's like, what do you mean? Where, where's the thousand dollars? And he said, oh, I'll give you one dollar a year, each year. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it really matters, the implementation of how uh -huh. the payment and the deal and all the other terms are, you know, come into mm -hmm. play. So really, it's not that much about the price. There are so many things besides the price, like the timing, the non-monetary items, the emotional needs that all need to be factored into an effective negotiation. Yeah. And so given all of this information, I mean, I think it would be really interesting to hear your take and talk about how is negotiation changing in the future? Because we've seen technologies such as Google Home or Google Voice that will call somebody, it'll call a barber shop and make an appointment for you. But what right. happens when Google Voice can negotiate for you? Or what happens when you have these these different AIs that can negotiate on behalf of humans? What happens in that case? Yeah, yeah. So it's it's pretty scary because the, t the tools that we know and the hacks that we know and that we've discussed on this podcast, we're not the only ones who know them. And mm -hmm. we are good actors that want what's best for the world but not everyone operates in that way. And one example is robocalls, something that exists today. And robocalls have been around for a while, but they are getting better and better. And they are experts at using emotional manipulation to get people to do what they want them to do. So for instance, my sister's roommate got a call one day from the IRS, quote unquote, Mm -hmm. And the IRS called her and said that she was uh, delinquent on her taxes and she needed to wire transfer $20,000 or something like that right away or else she's going to get charged with tax fraud and she could go to jail and she's going to lose her career and her reputation and all of this stuff. And she was, my sister's roommate was sobbing in her bedroom like, oh, I can't believe I did this. I don't have the money yeah. right now. Like just freaking out, just being played like a marionette by a puppeteer. <laughs> and my, my sister's other roommate, Danny, who's like a really savvy guy, hears her crying, goes into her room and is like, hey, what's going on? Is everything okay? And she tells him the story and Danny is like instantly suspicious. And so he picks up the phone. He's like, oh, hi. Yes, who is this? Oh, taxes. Oh, interesting that you're that you're saying that this is, you know, that you've cited this, you know, county issue, even though what you're claiming is actually a federal issue. And he noticed all these different holes in the story that the uh -huh. person was was saying on the other end of the phone. And, it's, you know, within a few minutes, he realized this is a complete scam. I mean, yeah. this person is just pushing emotional buttons to try to get them to wire transfer $20,000. Yeah. And the same thing happens with phishing emails all the time. And there are so many ways to hack human emotions to get people to do what, what they is not actually in their best interest. That when you look forward towards AI, um, you know, what could happen down the road, it's really scary. I mean, unless there are safeguards in place, um, it, it could be really bad. So Yeah, especially since so we have all of this information about us online. So we all, especially what we've talked about on this podcast, all of this information about what we think, what we feel, what we care about is going to be available to some AIs to learn. And if, you know, at some point in the future, what we've said here is used against us in a negotiation because the AI can learn what we care about and <clears throat> all of these different things and th they can be way more effective negotiators against us and against people that have presence online that um, we, you know, the other side will almost certainly be in a more favorable position than we will if they're used in a, in a harmful way or a malevolent right. way against us. And that's what really terrified me about the whole Cambridge Analytica scandal is because mm -hmm. they use psychographic profiling, meaning mm -hmm. they knew what drives certain people and they use that to their advantage. And that kind of profiling is really powerful. 
Like imagine if you were able to profile everyone on Facebook, which is basically everyone who has an internet connection in the way, you know, and you categorize them by not only assertive accommodator and analyst types, but with AI, maybe there's a hundred different or a thousand different sub factions. And by Mm -hmm. finding all of these right slots to put people in, you can slightly tweak the messaging in just the right way. That'll be perfect for that type of person. Mm -hmm. And it could be so much more powerful, especially, I mean, the, well, I don't want to get too deep into it because this kind of gets into my worst, worst case maybe, scenario. I mean, maybe we t- we start talking about those because this, yeah, that's, that's what I, I I fear a lot of things about the technology um, coming and the future of uh, negotiation. So maybe we get into it. Okay, sweet. Let's take a quick break and then get into the future scenarios. All right, so Metamore, what do you think for the worst case scenario? Worst case scenario. Right, so my worst case scenario is a scenario in which AI systems are able to categorize all people Mm -hmm. psychographically to yep. such a degree that they are able to use all of the levers of negotiation and manipulation to get you to do whatever the hell they want you to do. Mm-hmm. So if, for instance, loss aversion is a huge driver of human behavior, someone is just as will desire gaining $10 just as much as they would hate to lose $5. So basically yeah. there's a 2x weight of not wanting to lose something versus wanting to gain something. Mm -hmm. So there are ways already that political robocallers, for instance, are able to drive people towards an action much more effectively using no questions as opposed to yes questions. So for instance, like everyone's gotten a call from a solicitor with a series of yes questions that are totally off-putting. So someone will call you and they'll say, they'll say, Hey, Justin, do you have a few minutes to chat? And you're like, uh, and then they're like, ah, do you, do you enjoy a nice glass of water from time to time? And you're like, well, yeah, but and like, <laughs> and do you like your water to be crisp and clean and filtered like, like mother nature intended? And you're like, well, yeah, but, and then by, by the end of it, you're like, I just want to say no, even though I know all of these answers are obviously yes. Like you just want to say like, no, I'm a camel. I don't need water. Go away. <laughs> But if instead you have a series of no questions, it makes the other person feel like they're in control. So for instance, for a political campaign, if you're calling and you say, you say, you say, hi, uh, is now a bad time? Which is much better than do you have a few minutes to chat? And you'll say, no, it's, it's not. And they'll say, now, do you think if the country goes on the path that it's currently on, everything's going to be all right? And you're like, no, I think it's a terrible direction that the comp- that the country is going. And I say, like, and do you, are you going to sit idly by while Obama goes into the White House and does you know passes all these policies that are against the good good hearted conservative American values? And you'll say, no, I'm not going to sit idly by. And they say, well, will you do something right today and pledge a donation to make sure that doesn't happen? All of a sudden, it's way more powerful. You feel like uh-huh. you're in the driver's seat, and by saying no, you feel like you have more control. And then if so, if you couple that kind of strategy with a loss aversion strategy, like making them feel like they're going to lose the country they have unless they do something Mm -hmm. um, or like this was used by Cambridge Analytica to get people to basically stay home and not vote by saying that you'll lose your rights if Hillary gets elected because Hillary doesn't care for urban communities. Like that was a big tactic of Cambridge Analytica. Mm -hmm. But anyways, my point is that there are all of these pulleys and if an AI system were able to learn the pulleys and psychographic profile people to such a degree, then they would have unbridled capabilities of manipulating. Mm -hmm. And I think the worst scenario possible is if people don't even know whether they're talking or negotiating with a human or not. So imagine with Google Voice, if you get a call from a telemarketer and it sounds like it's a real person and this person has better negotiating skills than any human in the history of existence. Mm-hmm. 
-hmm. What are the odds that that person is going to get you to do what they want you to do? Pretty high. And then if that if that robocaller AI is able to dial at the speed of machines, which is way faster, it could basically spread and change public opinion and public behavior like a like a huge firestorm. Yeah, I mean, it, and it can do it in parallel. It doesn't have to do it one after the other. Right, it can just do it, right. Basically, all of it at once. So my worst yeah. case is that scenario, and it's without enough safeguards, enough solutions to counteract that potential, and without enough regulatory <laughs> oversight to make it known that you're dealing with an AI and that you're at risk for these emotional exploits. Yeah, I mean, that's that touches some on um, what I was um, thinking too. Yeah, one of the your, other things. What's your yeah, worst so case? One of the other things I was thinking for the worst case is more of a worst case um, for at least how I view negotiation as an analytical type. You know, for me, it would be real. It would be chaos if we had you know a whole bunch of negotiation where it's just like let's get it all out there and you know <laughs> right, yeah, like right. all of the, all of this craziness. Basically, if you know for a for a um, and then let's see for the assertive type it would be if the if the world was you know a bunch of analytical people mm -hmm. um so basically if if you're matched up with the uh your you know your worst case person on a regular basis like that would be bad for everybody negotiating um it, you know that's that doesn't really account for any of the technological advancements and then for technology it was basically the same thing you said where there's this this ai that can basically convince anybody to do um what the ai wants them to do or whatever whoever is behind mm -hmm. this ai and the the issue i see is that this type of power will only be in the hands of people and companies that have a lot of power Right, it's like um, a winner-take-all scenario where it all aggregates at the top of the pyramid. Yeah, and, and we've seen this sort of theme pop up in a lot of our worst-case scenarios, but this one this one seems particularly bad just because you're really manipulating people to do what you want. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, you know, it, it'll probably aggregate in the hands of these, these few powerful people. And you know, if some of these powerful people have the best interest, the um, the best interests of everybody in the world and you know Earth in mind, maybe that's not the worst case. You know, maybe <laughs> maybe having people that actually have the best interests of everybody at heart with all the negotiation power, maybe it wouldn't be so bad. But I don't think that's very likely. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, maybe speaking of the, the best case, what, what do you think? Best case scenario. Yeah, so my best case is actually a world where you don't really need to negotiate. Because mm -hmm. when you think about what negotiation actually is doing, negotiating negotiation is matching up different people with different objectives in the best possible way so that they achieve the best joint outcome. And that's mm -hmm. not something that has to be done through conversation. It can be done through an algorithm if the algorithm is good enough. For instance, Upwork already has a pretty good way of doing this. For instance, if I'm looking to hire an engineer to build a website, I can post to Upwork my description. I can set the price range that I'm willing to pay. I can set if I want to have people in the U.S. or people worldwide, and I can set other filters like people who have been highly rated from past jobs and people who have already earned a lot of money, so they already have like a big enough track record. And within minutes, I can get matched up with many good options. And then the contract is already there. And then we just work together, and it's all settled. You don't have to do any of this back and forth. So imagine if you had a system like that, but even more advanced, where it doesn't only account for the stated needs, like you know, getting it done by this date, with this budget, with these specs, but it also takes care of more of the emotional needs and 
whether this is someone who would be a good fit for you working together based on your different personality types, whether your goals are aligned for more long term. Maybe there are other things that neither of you guys know, but that the AI might know, like maybe this person that you might hire as an engineer also happens to work with people who fill out other needs that your organization has. And so they can match like, oh, this organization, they notice not only do you need engineering help, you also need design help for your website. And based on your brand identity, this group would be really great for you. So my best case scenario is a world where anyone can match with the right person for whatever their objective is, so long as they describe their objectives well enough and the AI has access to enough information. And then no one is really at risk because the contract is already made, the safeguards are already in place. And as far as robocalls and that sort of thing, I imagine a really, I mean, they already have robocall killer is one app. Uh, mm -hmm. Google has its own call screener, which will filter out any sort of spam calls. Uh, Google's Gmail has gotten a lot better at filtering out spam. So mm -hmm. if you imagine that on the defensive side, if technology gets better and better at defending people, and if policymakers get better at saying, look, you are not able to call someone with this voice technology, supposing you're a human, unless you state you are dealing with an AI, this is not a human. Like if there are some good policies like that in place and most contracts are done through, you know, intelligent matching through algorithms and also like smart contracts that are flexible enough so that you can't screw someone over by putting something in the fine print. Like it ha you have to have stated intentions. Like maybe if there was even a system where if like LegalZoom flags something problematic, it can ask you in regular language like, just so you're aware, you realize that if a hurricane comes, that means like the deal is totally gone and, and you mm -hmm. lose all your money. Like if they just like say things in human terms that lawyers like spend so much time and energy obfuscating so that they can charge more. Yeah. Just so everything is fully transparent. And maybe there's even like you can ask your OS, like you can ask Siri, like Siri, like, is this really the best deal? Like all the terms of this contract, like let's do a little dialogue back and forth to make sure that I fully understand what's going on. Um, mm -hmm. Like if you sort of had your own sort of AI advisor that knew all the information and really knew what was best for you and the other party. And the final aspect I'll say in my best case is a really effective rating system. So you know who you're dealing with, you know what their track record is, you know what people have thought about them in the past. And this can get a little bit black mirror-y, you know, like that one episode where everyone gets raided. But I think ultimately for society to be as efficient and effective as it can be, we are going to need some sort of rating system to know how dependent different people are. And, and uh, you know, that'll help us interact to a, a much better, better degree. Yeah. No, th I mean, that's, there's, there's a lot of good stuff there. Um, for my best case... I so contrary to what I said in the very beginning where you know negotiation is only for the it sounded like I was saying <laughs> negotiation is only for the individual um but no I was you know I think what I missed out there is it's you know it's, yes you are getting what you want but the other party is also getting what they want because there's no long term collaboration if the other party does not have you know if they're not happy with the outcome even if you got what you want you're never right, going and your to have a positive your reputation precedes you. If you screw yeah. people over and you're known for screwing people over, pretty soon no one's going to want to deal with you. Yeah, and and that was something I I you know left out inarticulately. Um, but anyways, the the best case is along those lines using negotiation to bring people together because right now we have a political system where everybody is on complete opposite ends of the spectrum. We just have this, this crazy bipolar or crazy polar um, political system where no, there's no negotiating with the left and the right, really. Like there's, there's not really anyone getting what they want. And there's, if we can use negotiation it, and if we have an AI system that can almost negotiate on behalf of others where it's, it's more rational, it's less, of a political ideology thing, and we can kind of have these these AI agents negotiating on behalf of, 
you know, the left and the right, maybe we can start to become a little bit more center and a little bit more mm -hmm. rational about things. And um, I think that that has the potential to truly change the outcome of the world when things change at a policy level, things, everything can change for the better if, you know, both sides are getting what they want, because then we can find the commonalities between the left and the right. Or, you know, in other countries, there might be a few different parties, but they're still finding some common ground and making policies that work with each other. And yeah. maybe we can solve some of these huge issues we're facing today, like climate change, like the healthcare crisis, and all of, you know, all of these other things that are super um, bipartisan or super um, partisan and make them a little bit more bipartisan and right. a little bit more towards the center so we can have more rational conversations and have better outcomes for everybody rather than what, you know, what your party says you should believe. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And then, you know, everything you said was also, you know, stuff that I was sort of thinking about. Um, but well, not all of it, but there was a lot of good stuff you said there, so I'm not going to reiterate that. Um, but what do you think for the likely scenario? Most likely scenario. Yeah, so my likely scenario is one in which the current trends of negotiation are going to continue, meaning you brought up politics where there's the right and the left, and they do seem to be more concerned with winning from a debate mm -hmm. perspective as opposed to finding the best joint solution and outcome from a negotiation perspective. And there are, there are simple ways that this can be improved, and I think we're already seeing it, especially in the intellectual dark web with people who are more nuanced and more able to sort of take the long view rather than just agree with whatever the current party politics are. And that's done by getting the other party to say, that's right. Those are the magic words in a negotiation. So if someone is totally on the other side of an issue, like let's say in the testimony with William Barr, and you know Kamala Harris is is interrogating him, and clearly they are on totally different sides of the spectrum, different different viewpoints or whatever. And typically, mm -hmm. what'll happen is Kamala will just try to win and peg him into a certain an, into a certain point, so she can own him. And then mm -hmm. every that'll be a big headline, and then the, the liberal press will come and go out go after him. But if instead takes more of the approach of trying to summarize. Will Barr, where he's coming from, what he's trying to do, what his values are, and then get him to say, that's right, yeah, that's what my motivations are. Even just by getting that point, it'll really be opened up and people will be better at, at coming to an agreement. So I actually do think that trend is going to get better over time because I think I, it does seem like there's a subcurrent of people trying to do what's best for everyone more mm -hmm. than just trying to do what's best for their in-group of people. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm hopeful in that regard. Um, but unfortunately, I think that the trend of most of the negotiation power aggregating at the top is also going to continue. So I think that a lot of these big corporations, big, big uh, co you know, companies are going to be able to manipulate the masses to a greater degree in the future than has ever been possible in the past. And I can only hope that policymakers are able to catch up with this and make some effective changes. So I'm hopeful in one, I'm hopeful with this subcurrent that's probably not the mainstream, taking mm -hmm. enough, getting enough momentum that it becomes the mainstream. But I'm also cognizant that the mass trend is more ability to manipulate and negotiate at the top of the pyramid and more vulnerability towards the bottom of the pyramid. And it seems like that's going to continue as well. Yeah. My, my likely kind of echoes that last point about these, especially if AIs are created that can negotiate on behalf of organizations or individuals. Um, I think, I think honestly, 
in in that case, the likely case is going to uh, resemble the worst case, where you, we do have the this asymmetry where the the rich and the powerful become more rich and more powerful because of these these AI systems that can negotiate on behalf. I will also say, though, in the likely case, that I think negotiating AI's negotiating on behalf of humans is going to be one of the last things an AI can effectively do because there's so much fluidity and so much context that the AI needs to understand before any of this can be done. So the the thing that I think, you know, is kind of a saving grace is that if we have an AI that's good enough to truly be a masterful negotiator, it's pretty much already going to be an artificial general intelligence. And maybe if that's the case, we might be able to, you know, maybe that'll move to a situation where that AGI is a little bit better at governing people and making decisions. And maybe it's one of those benevolent dictator type of AGIs that can do stuff or it does stuff that's on um, it. They do things in behalf on behalf of the entire world population, depending on what the objective function of this, this AI is. If we can truly align the goals of humans and this AI. Um, yeah. I, I, I hope that's the case. I don't know how yeah. far off we are from this because negotiation is, it's really just word processing, like understanding the meaning of the words and then understanding what the right response is. And one thing that came to mind as you were speaking is that there's the 738.55 rule, which is that 7% of information is conveyed from the words themselves. 55 or 38% is conveyed from the tone of the words that you're using. Mm -hmm. And then 55% is conveyed from your actual body language. So really what we're asking of AI is number one and number two, understanding the words and also understanding tone. And, you know, this this includes passing the Turing test, like to be able to not know that you're dealing with an AI. But we're already pretty close to that with with Google Voice. I mean, the, in the examples that they released, at least the people on the yeah. other end had no idea they were talking to a computer. Yeah. And it wasn't it was perfect. Very... But it only has to be better than the average human to be scary. It doesn't have to be better than all people to be scary. But I agree, it probably would take some AGI before it's better than all people. But I don't think we're that far from it being better than the average person. Yeah, so natural language processing isn't that far along in terms of development. It's good. But the, one of the big things with negotiation is actually understanding the meanings of words and the context of words. There, are so, there have been but some But rank brain already, already does suppose to understand the meaning of words. Yeah, in a super rudimentary way compared to human understanding of words and context. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not really that close to human level, even like very low level um, humans. So if you had to estimate how many years it would take to get to average human level, what would you say? Uh, in terms of word understanding, the meaning it's basically being able to read something and get the understanding to and, read yeah. to take a, a word input and give an appropriate response as well as a human average human. Yeah, I guess so. It depends on the complex, like the complexity of the entire context of the negotiation. So if there's a lot of different things that this this AI needs to understand, there's that's one of the things that AI is not very good at is understanding like these little common sense things about um, the the world. And there's a lot of context that humans understand without even thinking about it that an AI just can't understand yet. Mm -hmm. um, I will also say though that OpenAI recently had a paper that had a text understanding and text generation um, system that was really good. It wasn't it wasn't really that close to human level, but it was definitely state of the art for AI. 
Um, and it was supposedly so good that they didn't release their actual source code on it, wow. which they do for a lot of other stuff because they, they try to open source everything, but they realize that people could use such a system for nefarious purposes. So. Right. That's why I never I never respond to a phone call or answer a phone call if I don't already have that person in my contact list. Like, mm -hmm. I just never do it anymore. Mm -hmm. And it, yeah. I can't tell you how many times some baby boomer in my life has forwarded me an email like, can you help me out with this? And it's just clearly a phishing email. It's like from squarespace.com and it's got like two E's in space. Oh, and it's wow. like, and, I, and as a digital native, like millennial, I can spot it right away. But like mm -hmm. baby boomers have no idea a lot of the times. Mm -hmm. And so especially the people that are most at risk are the older population for sure. Mm -hmm. And the amount that someone, a new digital native has to learn is pretty amazing. And the amount of mistakes that can be made as you're going through that learning process mm -hmm. is also increasing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, there are definitely things, it doesn't need to be this AI, what, you know, whatever is happening, it doesn't need to be human level to be dangerous. Right. Definitely. All you need is something simple, like use loss aversion. And yeah. if, like, if you just say like, oh, you're going to lose out on this, you know, you'll lose out on your tax return unless you update your password right now. Most mm -hmm. people will freak out and enter their password and they don't even realize it's a phishing site and now they're going to get all this money stolen from their bank account. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that's, especially with the persuasion tactics, that is, that's something that's happening now. Like that, yeah. that is happening on a wide scale now. Now what I, what I was kind of saying I think will take a while is when you have a true negotiation where there is somebody trying to get what's best for them. Let's say I'm trying to get what's best for myself or like trying to negotiate my situation or my wants and goals with somebody else. Um, but that other agent is an AI system. I think it'll be a long time before that AI system can negotiate with me on the same level that you could negotiate with me or somebody like a real person could negotiate, you know, like a, a salary bump or is like, I don't know, these. dude, I, I, I'm a lot less, I'm a lot, um, I guess more progressive minded in this area, because even if you don't think of it as a negotiation, there are currently mm -hmm. systems in place that play off of this. Like for instance, I tried to cancel my audible subscription a while ago and they said, mm -hmm. are you sure you're going to cancel? If you cancel, you'll lose out on these credits. And I was like, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm sure. Even though it hurts. Cause that, that pulls up my loss aversion. Uh -huh. And then it said, oh, well, if you continue your subscription now, we're actually going to drop the price by this amount. So they already have tiered decision making that effectively negotiates with you. And it's all based on a decision tree. And it's intelligent enough to know that if I try to do that same thing again and cancel my subscription, it won't work. It only offers it to me the one time. And so th this okay. is already getting more and more advanced. And even though it's not like an AI voice, like conversing back and forth with me yeah that's, that's still negotiation and it still is scary effective and yeah, it's like I it's guess... kind of like dark ui patterns yeah that makes sense so if, if you look at negotiation not in terms of like a conversation with some other agent you know on the phone or over some sort of chat device where you're it's not really a conversation it's just kind of like it's a, a means to find a joint outcome between two parties with somewhat aligned yeah. goals it's like the same thing when you're you're trying to book a flight and there are all these tactics to get you to buy airline insurance or to get you to upgrade your seat and saying you know this many people just insured their flight in the last hour are you really going to lose out on your 447 dollar and 23 cent purchase by not choosing insurance it's not recommended are you sure? Like this is already something very prominent and it's only going to get better. It's, it's not going to get worse. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, that's, that's definitely a, probably a better way to look at it, looking at negotiation in terms of just any means to find some sort of common goal or common, um, a way to, yeah, I guess a way to find the best joint outcome. 
yeah, yeah. I, I think that's probably a better way to look at it rather than just a conversation. Now, that that will take a while, but you're right. We are pretty much there in terms of negotiation now with the decision tree process and this whole yeah. persuasion that um, – pretty much any any sort of digital company is taking advantage of at this point so yeah i you you've just uh, i mean free trials me annual <laughs> subscription discounts like all of these things are persuasion negotiation tactics yeah and you've just persuaded me of that point that this <laughs> <laughs> that a conversation isn't the only way to negotiate well, it's in your best interest too so. <laughs> That's a good, I think that's a good place to wrap it up, probably. Yeah, yeah, it's been a fun episode. Three very important things. All right, well, thank you, everyone, for listening. This has We're going to talk about what has happened, what is, what is currently happening, and time. what will inevitably happen. The past, the present, and the 